In this video, we're going to be discussing the corresponding parts of congruent triangles. So a new abbreviation that we are going to be using in proofs is CPCTC. So let's talk about what that stands for. It stands for corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. So when we use CBCTC in a proof, it is after the triangles have already been proven congruent. And that's important because when we are using that abbreviation, we have to have the congruent triangles in order to apply it. So a quick way to recognize this is that it's most likely used when the proof statement is not about congruent triangles. Of course, there could always be exceptions. That's why I have most likely written here. Um, but that's going to be the quickest way to think about, do I need to use CBCTC in this proof? So let's take a look at some basic proofs. And we're just going to see, based on the proof statement, if we would have to use CBCTC or not. Okay, And again, these are all relatively straightforward proofs. So they are going to follow that rule that if the proof statement is not about congruent triangles, that CBCTC would be used. So in number one, the proof statement is that angle A is congruent to angle C. That is not about congruent triangles. So in this one, yes, we would use CPCTC. So again, that's what we're answering here. Would we be required to use CPCTC? And we'll look at some full proofs um, in just a minute so that you could see how it would be applied. Number two is about congruent triangles. So no, CPCTC would not be required. Number three, the proof statement is about congruent segments. So yes, CPCTC. And number four, it's about congruent triangles. So no. Number five, the proof looks a little different here. It says C is the midpoint of AD. So this is not about congruent triangles. So yes, we will use CPCTC. And finally, for the last one, same thing, not about congruent triangles. So we will use CPCTC in that proof, okay? So let's take a look at an actual written proof so you can see the application of it, not just memorize when to use it. So if we look at question seven here, I've already gone ahead and set up the two columns and written the givens. Um, it tells us that JK and NM are congruent. I'm going to mark those off in my diagram. JL and NL are congruent. I will mark those off. And we know that L is the midpoint of KM. We're asked to prove that angle JKL and angle NML are congruent to one another. So I'm going to actually just ignore that proof statement for a second and go with our goal that we've been doing, which is prove the triangles are congruent. So I notice in the givens here, there's something I can elaborate upon this definition of midpoint. And I know based on that, that KL must be congruent to ML because of the definition of a midpoint, which is that a midpoint splits a segment into two congruent parts. And since I've said these two parts are congruent, I'm going to mark those off in my diagram. This particular proof does not have any application of the reflexive property since the triangles don't share any sides or angles. I don't have vertical angles and I really have everything I need at this point to prove the triangles are congruent. So I know right now that triangle JKL is congruent to triangle NML. And the reason I know that is because my diagram matches one of our five methods of congruency. And in this case, it's side, side, side is congruent to side, side, side. Now, previously, this is where we have really finished a proof. Once we proved the triangles are congruent, we stopped. But we have this extra proof statement here. Like this proof is currently incomplete because I didn't prove what the problem was actually asking me to do. So I want to prove that JKL and NML, those angles are congruent. So here's how CBCDC works. It says that corresponding parts, JKL and NML, those angles are corresponding parts of congruent triangles. Are they part of congruent triangles? Yes, we just show that. Well, that means therefore they have to be congruent. It basically means once the triangles are congruent, all of the 
pieces and all of the parts of those triangles are congruent as long as they correspond to each other. So it's as simple as writing this in our proof. We're going to write angle JKL is congruent to angle NML, basically the proof statement the problem gives us. And for a reason, we just write CPCTC. It's because they are corresponding parts of congruent triangles and therefore they are congruent. Okay, so this was a relatively short proof um, and we're going to take a look at one other. All right, in number eight, uh, we have a little bit of a longer proof here. We're going to see that the givens don't tell us anything is congruent um, to something else, right? It just says that we have perpendicular lines and parallel lines. There's no congruent symbols. So that's how I can tell that this proof is probably going to be a little bit longer. So first, based upon the perpendicular uh, symbol, I know I have right angles. And again, I've already gone in and written the givens in my proof. So I know that angle A and angle H are right angles. And my reason is that perpendicular lines form right angles. Anytime we say that they are right angles, we want to also add in that they are congruent. So angle A is congruent to angle H because all right angles are congruent. And I will mark those in my diagram. So I've talked about the first two givens with the perpendicular symbols. I also have one other given here that's telling me about parallel lines. It tells me that HT and AM are parallel. So whenever I see parallel lines, I like to highlight them in my picture make a Z shape of some sort, in this case, a backward Z. And that helps me find the alternate interior angles, which are in the corner of that Z shape where the Z bends. So I know I'm going to talk about in line four, the two alternate interior angles. So angle HTM and angle AMT are alternate interior angles. I'm going to kind of follow the same format that I did in lines two and three. Like once I identify the type of angle, I'm going to say uh, basically how they were formed. So this was parallel lines cut by a transversal form alternate interior angles. And in line five, I'm going to say those are congruent to each other. So angle HTM is congruent to angle AMT because alternate interior angles are congruent. So at this point, I have written my givens and also elaborated upon all of them. Now I notice in my picture here, I only have two markings per triangle. That's because I can add the reflexive property to this proof. So I can say TM is congruent to itself by the reflexive property. And now I have three markings per triangle, which allows me to prove the triangles are congruent. So I'm going to say triangle HTM is congruent to triangle AMT. And the reason I have in this uh, diagram here is angle angle side there are two angles marked off in each triangle and a side that is not between them now we've been pre proving triangles are congruent but notice I didn't actually prove my proof statement here so I have to add on that HT is congruent to AM and the reason behind that is CPCTC it's because HT and AM are corresponding parts of congruent triangles, therefore they must be congruent. So hopefully this video helped you understand when to use CPCTC.